Well, I'm joined today on this Lunch Club podcast by uh, Steve Bailey, who's written numerous episodes of TV shows in the UK, Europe and America, including Spooks, Primeval, The Transporter, Musketeers, Versailles, Strike Back, and the Emmy Award-winning German Cold War thriller Deutschland 83. Some of his most recent work includes episodes of season two of Riviera, Hackerville, and the Deutschland 83 sequel, Deutschland 86. Uh, he's recently been working between London and Berlin as lead writer and co-executive producer for Deutschland 89, and has just completed writing for Riviera Season 3. Steve, you're a busy man. It, it, it all sounds good when you say it like that. <laughs> it, uh, I, have, I am busy. I am busy. Uh, and um, thank the Lord I am. So all good. all good. Has it always been that way? I mean, have there been times when the phone wasn't ringing and you were terrified? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> God, yes. Uh, and I think, you know, that's true of any writer, that's true of any freelancer, um, anybody who, uh, you know, lives off their wits and uh, dances along those cliff edges. Uh, you, you, you frequently get those uh, times in life. But I've been very blessed the past few years, um, uh, even with COVID, even with this past year. Um, I've been busy. I've been gainfully employed. Uh, just doing the work so all good so how did it how did it all kick off for you I mean I always think of it as you know if you're joining the great world of showbiz it is a bit like running away to the circus how, how did your mm. story start uh, I uh, very briefly I um, studied film and literature at Warwick University found my way to London uh, got a job working part-time for a casting director that was kind of my first little toe in the door got to know uh, a bunch of agents and the purpose of that uh, in the course of that job and got offered a job um, working at a big talent agency which was then Duncan Heath Associates they're now called Independent and Duncan was very much my first mentor wonderful man still running the agency and I became a literary agent um, over the course of uh, a year or two working there and, and then did that for another few years read a thousand scripts a year for four or five years. Always wanted to write. Finally sat down, wrote a script, sent it out um, under a pseudonym with a covering letter from me to various people in the business going, this is this young writer I've been working with, I think you might like him. And uh, they started calling me back and said, we'd like to meet that guy. And I said, haha, it was me. And nobody um, took offense. And then I got my kind of first big proper sexy job was doing an episode of spooks off the back of that spec script so that was where it that was where the writing started properly it's a pretty big break to get first off isn't it spooks i mean that was a major it's bbc wasn't yeah. it yeah yeah bbc bbc one um and i did an episode in season two and i mean it was pretty overwhelming they didn't ask me back put it that way <laughs> so <laughs> i still had a lot uh, to learn in those days but it was uh, you know i've always been a great believer in jumping in at the deep end in life and uh I get thrown at the deep end there, and I haven't seen it in years. I don't know if it stands up still or not, but at the time I was very pleased and proud to be part of that show. So. I mean, it's a, it was a mega show, and actually Nick Haig, yeah. a Lunch Club member, has a question along these lines. If you had to choose from the many professional roles you've had, and you could have only one, what would you prefer, agent, producer, or writer? Oh, writer, definitely, definitely a writer. Uh, you know, if you'd asked me when I was a teenager what did I wanted to, what I wanted to be when I grew up out of said writer. I didn't really know what kind of writing then. Um, it could have been anything from journalism to novels, um, but definitely writer. And looking back on the grand scheme of things, everything was kind of building towards just finally having the confidence to sit one down one day and try and write a script and uh, see how that turned out. And now I could, you know, I've been doing it, I don't know, 20 odd years now. I couldn't do anything else. I have no transferable skills short of, uh, you know, taking a Pittman secretary course and going and becoming somebody's uh, PA. Uh, if, if, if the writing stops tomorrow, I don't know what I would do. So so how does how does it work for you on a typical day? What's your, do you have a particular process beating a blank page or do you just, does it, you know, does it usually just come yeah. to you? Or? It varies, um, to be honest. It, it's um, in an ideal world, I like to start early and do a good five, six, seven hour day. And those are the really productive days, but it's very rarely an ideal world and life gets in the way, admin gets in the way. Um, traveling in normal times gets in the way. So I'm used to writing on trains and planes and in hotel rooms and all that. So I don't have an exact process. I just, all I know is that it gets done and it mm. gets done by the time it's supposed to be 
done. And you have good days and you have bad days. And you have the frustrating days. I, I know my process well enough to trust that there are days where you barely write a word, but I know it's all going on in my head, yeah. even while I'm doing the laundry or emptying the dishwasher or faffing about, you know. Yeah, no, and that's then, right. then when it finally starts coming out on the page, that's that's very satisfying and, and rather relaxing. Cause it's, you, it, you, you, yeah. it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I, 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 that really does resonate. I mean, the early mornings, I, I'm a great believer in that as well. You knew, mm -hmm. I've never regretted an early night. And, um, and, and kind of the... The knowing it's t is sort of ticking along in the background and allowing that space, you know, that for me is a great piece of advice to anyone in any creative field. It's so you can't, you just can't always drag it out of yourself like rags from your brain. It's like Absolutely. the brain. It's funny how the brain works, isn't it? It is, uh, 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 and I'm a great believer. And I think any writer will tell you this: uh, you have to get something done on the page ultimately, and you have to allow yourself to be free to write rubbish, you know, and write a few pages of uh, of. I know I'm going to change all this, but I'm writing. Um, it's moving forward. And you might write five pages of rubbish, but there's a couple of lines in it or a beat in it or a scene in it that starts to open it up for you. And you keep moving forward, you keep moving forward. And then, it's, of course, it's all about rewriting, always, always, always. Um, so uh, I, I, it's really just, I think it was Raymond Chandler who talked about the process of just sitting your ass down, sitting in front of the typewriter for four or five hours and that's all you do and the rest comes off itself and I think there's quite a lot of truth in that still yeah and it's it's a it's a funny two-way street as well once it does start to flow you know I guess then you find your rhythm you you get the voice of the characters you kind of know where the plot points are coming and you it, yeah. it sort of opens up the gears a bit like a, you know go through the gears of a car you know what's the yeah. tough bits done do, do you do you do beat sheets and kind of plan out your treatments and so forth uh, I generally do just because the kind of shows I work on that that's inevitably uh, inevitably part of the process. Um, so the you know you, uh, it takes a village to make a television show, and um, I'm always working with producers and story editors and script editors and, uh, and the like. So are you, are you are you quite collegiate in that? Are you are you quite do you oh, quite yeah. enjoy that? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah, um, the, you know that image of the lonely writer sitting in its gar in his garret doesn't really apply to television too yeah. much. Um, it's, uh, it's much more uh, social than that. And that's part of the fun of it. But of course, you, you, you then are the guy that has to go away and sit in front of the blank page and actually write the bastard. Um, and uh, that's the other side of the job. So you've got to be able to balance both. It's kind of an upside down pyramid, isn't it? I mean, it's all on you. Without you digging the gold and coming up with the nuggets, there's no show. Uh, yes. Um, and equally, I get some of my best ideas come from being in a room with other people. You know, yeah, now I want to ask you about this because Judith Klukas, sorry to cut in, has just asked, um, I'd be interested to hear Steve Bailey's thoughts on the role of the BBC's writer's room and why UK commissioners fail to embrace its potential as an engine for high-end scripted content. Because, you know, that that kind of group sort of, yeah. that we've just been referring to, you know, what, what do you make yeah. of that? Uh, I think it's a really... Good question. And I personally have no direct experience of the writer's room in any shape or form, neither, you know, as someone who went through it, nor as someone who's ever um, been asked to engage with people on it, which I would happily do if I was asked. Um, I think it, it, the problem with writing or getting into writing for television or film or any medium, really, is that there just simply is no set path to do it. Everybody has to find their own way. Everybody's journey is different. Um, but Things like the writer's room are so important to just kick a door open a bit, to let a few people in uh, and give them a glimpse of what's on the other side of it. And, you know, those kind of shows that I started out on, the, the casualties and the bills and all that are great training grounds for new writers and younger writers. And the two aren't always the same and are not mutually exclusive. Um, so more schemes like the writer's room are good. But I have noticed in the past two, three years, um, the bigger production companies are starting to do similar processes on a sort of annual basis. They invite submissions and they pick a few writers to work with. And <clears throat> lots of initiatives going on now looking for underrepresented voices within the industry as well. So hopefully people will start to find, it's a little easier to find some kind of doorway to to, to tilt your hat at to, to start getting through initially but 
you have to bang on a lot of doors. You have to bang on a lot of doors. And even doing it as long as I've been doing it, you're still banging on doors always. And they don't always open for you. Yeah. Um, so Ju- it takes persistence. And it's persistence and, and being really good at juggling plates and holding lots of things in your mind at once. Because you're not only writing, you're kind of your own manager, motivator, yeah. personal trainer. You know, yeah. you're your own cheerleader. And you've got to deal with, you know, the, all the different relationships. So I'm interested to ask about, you've worked with so many outlets um you know you've worked with amazon and hbo what's the kind of do you find the process is similar with them or do they have their own tone or how, how do you look at that uh well everybody um on every show is is different um, um not wildly different but everybody has kind of different processes i'm lucky in that by and large really i don't have to deal with the big boys that's somebody else's problem um i'm dealing with um at, at, at the top end of the people I deal with, it's the producers and executive producers who are actually, you know, very hands-on in the production of the show. And they deal with the broadcasters, they deal with the BBC or the Amazons or the ITVs or whoever. So I don't have to um, really engage with that very much. And I, to be honest, I, I, which is a bad thing to admit, but half the time I don't really know who those executives are at the broadcasters. I might meet somebody at a party occasionally and and somebody has to take me aside and tell me that that's the person that ultimately <laughs> commissioned the yeah, show for the channel. For and, for everything, yeah, yeah, be nice to them. So, yeah. uh, so no, with me, it's I'm lucky. I'm, I basically get to work with creative people, and I don't have to deal so much with the uh, executive aspects of it. Yeah, it is complicated. There are so many. I think you know people think of screenwriting and imagine it's just great fun. You know, knock about. You know, you're writing Guardians of the Galaxy, having the time of your life. Yeah, but actually, yeah. you know, there are, there is a lot riding on. You know, every single moment of the development process. The the you know, as you say, rewriting and then you know being on set. And actually, this is the thing that amazes me about you. Suddenly, here we are. You're the co-executive producer and lead writer on Deutschland eighty nine. You know, that must be a lot of responsibility and pressure. Can you just walk us through those roles and how that works? Well, um, with Deutschland, I mean, Deutschland was, was a wonderful show to be part of for those three seasons. And I started out writing a script in 83. And then um, on 86, they asked if I would come to Berlin full time for six months to, to do a proper full on writer's room, which we did. And then in 89, we did a similar, not exactly similar, we did a very similar process. So I went there and uh, moved there full time for a few months while we developed the series. Um, but again, the, you know, the truth is my part in it, um, it is, it's, it's the creative side of it. And by the time the show actually starts filming, I'm three countries and two series away. And um, I rarely do set visits, uh, usually because it's just so far away. And, and I think a lot of writers will empathize with this when I do go on set. I, uh, I don't know where to stand. I'm tripping over the cables. I'm trying not to get in shot. And nobody uh, on the floor knows who you are. And they're wondering who the weird guy in the corner is and do we need to call security? <laughs> you know. So um, my my job tends to mostly end with, you know, once I've typed the end on the final episode of whatever I'm writing, uh, then uh, I'm off. I'm off. And it becomes somebody else's problem to how we're actually going to film this. Uh, and I regret I didn't once set foot on the set of Deutschland uh, in three years, and I do regret that. I wish I'd made the time to go and do it, especially the scenes that we filmed at the Stasi headquarters, which I'd been to as a tourist, but I'd love to have been there for some of that filming. Uh, there was even a point on Deutschland 89, there was a character called John Tyler Jr. He was an American older CIA guy on the verge of retirement, and I created him, I wrote him, and he was just going to be in one episode, episode two, I think it was. And he only really had one scene. He had this huge, big barnstorming speech. And I wrote it, and everybody really liked it. And everybody in the room, in the writer's room, took me by surprise. They said, we can only hear your voice when we read it. You have to wow. play this part. And I'm not an actor. I, they, you have to play this part. And they almost convinced me. And I was like, wow. maybe I should play this part. And then everybody liked the character so much, he kept turning up in later episodes. And by then, the part was just too big. There was, there was no way I could... Uh, I could maybe pull off one speech where I was sitting at a restaurant table, but the rest of it, forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever act, actually? Just... No, 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 never, uh, apart from school drama, uh, never acted, never had any uh, aspiration to act. Um, that would have been quite something, doing that part. But it also, it must. Have, how was it living in Germany? That must have been a laugh. 
I loved it. Of course, yeah, of course. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm very fortunate. I, you know, my son has grown up. I live alone, so I can do things like that. I can just back up and take off for a while. And um, I had, mm. you know, beautiful um, apartments were provided for me in Berlin. And, you know, when we did 89, the last one, I was living a couple of blocks away from Checkpoint Charlie, which for an old spy romantic like me who grew up on those kind of 60s and 70s spy movies and, you know, to be sitting there writing a Cold War series yeah. in a beautiful old period apartment um, a couple of blocks away from Checkpoint Charlie was uh, was wonderful, you know, and I felt very blessed that uh, life would take me in that direction. So I love Berlin. I got a lot of friends there. Um, my only problem with it is that every time we have done Deutschland, they make me do it in winter. And I have to go and live there. Yeah, it's really cold. <laughs> winter, I keep saying, can we not do this writers over the summer sometime? It's lovely summer, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, I have nothing but uh, love and admiration for Berlin and everybody there. I've always had a really good time. And I miss it. I'm back now in a couple of years because of COVID. I'm actually starting a new gig next week um, that, you know, we're doing it all on Zoom. Otherwise, I'd have been, I'd have been in Berlin probably now for a while. Um, so I miss that. I look forward to getting back on a plane again as soon as I can. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I love Berlin. It's such a, it, there's something very dreamy and magical about Berlin. I always kind of barrel into adventures whenever I go there. Mm. And I never, I always meet people, you know, and they're, they're, yeah. it's an incredibly welcoming city, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I had that in a way that I never really have anywhere else mm. in the world where I'd go out at night to do one thing and I'd end up, you know, six hours later, somewhere totally different that I hadn't seen coming with a bunch of people that I've only just met. And, you know, and I love that. Course, yeah, I love, I love that. that. And that must be that must be great from a story point of view as well. And there, there, there does seem to be a little affinity with Germany with you. You know, Hackerville for HBO, that was a cyber attack on a German bank. You know, what, yeah. what's, what's the German connection? Well, uh, what? I, I, weirdly, it all started with The Bill, if you remember uh, that old TV show. I do, yeah, uh, that's great. And about 12 years ago, I guess it was now, it was The Bill's 25th anniversary. And Jonathan Young, the then producer of The Bill, met uh, Jörg Winger, uh, the creator and producer of Deutschland, who at that time was producing a German shop, a cop show called Zoko Leipzig. And they'd met at some Fremantle conference and they came up with this was the idea to do, um, to combine the bill with Zoko Leipzig and do a special where you bring both casts together and a German girl gets kidnapped in London and taken to Germany and half the bill cast have to go after her and half the German cast came to London. and. Jonathan asked me to write that with a couple of German writers, uh, Frank uh, Koopman and Roland Heap, who I'm working with again, even now, and something else. And it was just a blast. We had the best time. And then Jörg um, came to me about Deutschland 83, not long after that. He, that idea was um, already germinating and um, came along and asked me to be involved. And then Hackerville was Jörg and Jonathan again, um, produced that. Jörg uh, co-created it with Ralph Martin. And they invited me along. So a lot of it is uh, it's basically repeat business, you know. It's yeah, it's working working with your mates, you know, it's working with guys that I'm very fond of that I've worked with a lot and, and there's great mutual creative trust there, which makes it a lot easier and also makes it fun, you know. We've had a lot of dinners together everywhere from Cardiff to Berlin to Bucharest and various points in between and so that's that's always a joyous journey to go on if I'm working with uh, those guys, which I will be again over the coming months on, on different things. So that makes me happy. And that's lovely. And aside from them, Doris Spriggs from the Lunch Club asks, what would be your dream writing job? Anything at all. You can write anything. If I could do anything at all. Anything. Uh, I think, I, well, I'm going to say uh, I'd write a Bond movie, um, but uh, I probably wouldn't because I enjoy them so much that I would... Um, <laughs> Be terrified of it, you know. And I love spies, and I love that whole thing. And I grew up in Bond, so uh, if Barbara Broccoli ever hears this, do you know? <laughs> well, I, I, call. I think but, Doris did work on a View to a Kill, actually, if memory serves. I think uh, uh, so. There you yes. go. <laughs> I think I, I think I know Doris's name. I think I know who Doris yeah. is. So hello, Doris. Uh, so that would be that would be a dream could but that is a dream that's not really in my um, orbit but let's but let's have a look at the dream then because if if barbara rockley is listening you know let's pitch it to her what would be how would you what direction would oh, you take bonds how would you do I it have, 
no idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I loved, um, I, I, I've loved how it has evolved through the years. Yeah. I think the secret with Bond is that he's always a man of his time. Yeah. And that Barbara and Michael have been so clever at, you know, always keeping that relevant. And uh, yeah, I like a bit of old fashioned Bond. I miss a little bit the kind of swagger and cheesiness of it. Mm. Was there in the past? It isn't there so much anymore but Daniel Craig's an incredible actor you know what he did with that character yeah he made him uh, ferocious I was he was properly yeah. you know, like a shark you know and, yeah. and it was more of the Connery than, yeah. than the Roger Moore I, I mean I grew up on Roger Moore and he was my kind of Bond oh. and I absolutely loved that absolutely yeah we just all... that just the tilting at the camera and the kind of I just felt I was part of the gang do you know yeah just... yeah no we all love Roger and Pierce you know I know Pierce wanted to take it more in the Daniel Craig direction but at the time that didn't seemed to happen or wasn't felt appropriate you know and and then when the next guy came along they they kind of let rip on that property so uh so i look for i'm looking forward to no time to die i'm looking forward to seeing who's going to step into the shoes next to all that yeah it's always tantalizing isn't it i've really missed him missed him actually the last couple of years you know it feels yeah. like it's been forever i'm just hoping that secretly in the wings they've been busy developing the next one and planning and before we know it there'll be another one out because mm. you know, we need it we need the entertainment you know we all need you need a bit of a pick me up we do the world always needs a bond so uh, bring it on bring it on right john Wolstenholme says what single top tip would you give to aspiring screenwriters and do you ever suffer from writer's block and if so how do you overcome it um my single top tip would be uh, it's a two-part tip. One is to um, read as many scripts as you can. So that's the best education. You know, you can read the books, you can read, you can do the courses. Reading scripts is the single biggest way to do it. And obviously, read some scripts and watch the end product and see how it went from that to that. Um, and then write every day, um, pretty, even if it's only a few sentences. Write every day. Develop your voice. Every writer starts out as an imitator, um, and you're not really going to get anywhere properly until you write your way through that, which you will do if you keep at it, and um, develop your own voice, and then you're off to the races. Do I get writer's block? Um, no, to be honest. Um, thank the Lord, or so far anyway. I have good days and I have bad days. Um, I have times where I start panicking about how little time I've left myself to get this thing over the finishing line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's not really block. That's it's what I was talking about earlier. It's just part of the process for me. Um, and the subconscious hasn't quite let go of what I needed to let go of yet. Um, but I'll get it there in the end. If I am having a day like that, and the clock is ticking and the deadline is looming, then I will sit down and just write anything to get the fingers warmed up. I have even, on occasion, if I'm struggling with a particular scene, gone and find somebody else's script, like a famous, or like a favorite old movie, find that script, find a similar scene, whether it's an action scene, a love scene, a drama, an argument, whatever, and I've typed that scene up mm. um, in somebody else's words, just as a kind of trying to open the brain, uh, trying to warm up the fingers, and that has worked for me. Um, I haven't done that often, but I've done that a couple of times. So no, I don't really get blocked, um, and if I do, then I get drunk and I, oh, I love that. Sit, sit down <laughs> late at night and I read what I've got and I scribble all over it and I go to bed and I get up the next morning and usually I find something in there that's uh, unlocked a door for me. What's the tipple of choice? Red wine. So oh, I very much uh, welcome your advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm there anytime you need. <laughs> Any point uh, on what I should be drinking this season? But no, I'm, I'm mostly a red wine man. Any particular place, grape or style? I like Old World on the whole. Nice. So, uh, mostly because I'm uh, I just, I've never really fully explored the world of red wine, but I tend to lean Old World and I, I tend to go to France, Italy, Spain, um, but especially France and Italy and just kind of lose my way through those. I, I, I just love it for the same reasons as you were talking about earlier, traveling with the scripts, traveling with the people, you know, with wine, it's yeah. just such a global, it crops up everywhere and it's just so social. It's I oh, just absolutely love it. It is, and I love, you know, if I am traveling, I do always, when I go to a restaurant or any kind of half-decent restaurant, I do ask them to tell me what I should be drinking in oh. terms of the wine. I, I, yeah. I like to, you know, go local. What should I, now that I'm here, what should I drink? What's 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 from the local soil? That know? is the best possible piece of advice ever. Actually, have you ever been given an amazing piece of advice yourself in your career? And if so, what was it? Mm -hmm. 
Um, have I ever given an amazing piece of advice in my career? Um, I'm sure I have. It doesn't spring to mind. The one thing that I do spring to mind that was just something I read um, that I very much keep in mind when I'm working was uh, William Goldman, wonderful mm -hmm. old screenwriter of Butch and Sundance and Sting and all those glorious movies and he wrote a fabulous book called Adventures in the Screen Trade about his life and times working as a writer in Hollywood. And there's a line in there somewhere where he says, just write the bastard. And yeah. I hang on to that frequently. Uh, I think yeah. that's a good piece of advice for any writer. It's, 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 a, it's, it's that grinding it out and just committing no matter what, to just move forward and get it done. No, I love that. That's that's yeah. absolutely right. Do you, do you use a specific piece of software actually for your scripts? Are you on? Uh, yeah, I use Final Draft, oh, which yeah. is pretty much industry standard and takes a lot of the hard work in terms of formatting out of it. Um, all writers hate it because it can be buggy at times, and we yeah. all had the experience with crashing and losing us pages and pages of work. But um, it's it it does what it says in the tin, and it does it very well for the most part. So yeah, I use that. Cool. Well, look, Kentius Bryan has got a question here. The rise of social influences being used to introduce TV shows to new audiences seemingly swallows up virtually all the soft finance for productions, sponsorship, product placement, tourist grants and all of that. What are your feelings about that? And have you, have you ever been asked to write in a part like that? Uh, no, I haven't. I've had no experience of that whatsoever. And I don't really, um, I wouldn't know where to begin. Yeah, it's, like it is a changed world, though, in terms of finance, isn't it? It's a funny one how I just think the landscape in the last 10 years has just changed so much with online and Netflix yeah. and the rest. Yes. Um, you know, the, the, certainly when I started out, you basically had BBC, ITV, Channel 4. And mm. If they all turned your idea down, you were screwed, whereas now that's very much not the case, um, which is wonderful for people like me because, you know, I now work, I think, for just about every major broadcaster or streamer in one form or another. Uh, but again, I'm, you know, I, I, I kind of what I was saying earlier, I don't really understand uh, the financing side of things. Mm. I never really have occasion to be involved in that, um, except to the extent of not writing exploding helicopters into something that I know can't <laughs> afford. Yeah, yeah. An exploding helicopter, how the show is actually financed. It's kind of somebody else's problem, as far as I'm concerned. I'll just, I'll write this here, and then you go and figure out how to actually make it. Um, and I should take more interest, probably, but um, that's just not the path I've gone down. Yeah. So. Well, I think also you probably develop that shorthand instinct. You know, you know if you're writing, we've got to talk about Riviera. If you're writing that, you know there's a tone and a yeah. vernacular, and you know what the scope of production is. Riviera, though, come on, how was that? Just finished season three. Oh. What an epic show! Oh, I love that show. Love that show. And that is a rare example where you, you get notes coming back saying, you get notes wanting you to up the budget. You get, you know that dialogue scene in the restaurant? Can we set that on board a private jet? Or wow. Can, that thing where she hails a taxi, can we? Can she get a helicopter instead from A to B? And go, Great. I'm, <laughs> that was such a joyful show to work on. Um, it's led by a wonderful man called Chris Tiquier, the executive producer. And Chris is just, looks after everybody top to bottom on the cast and crew and make sure everybody's having a good time and happy and um working with some of my favorite uh, creative people in the world Karen Manley who is executive producer um, and she and I worked on a few shows together in the past great script editors uh and and then you get to go and hang out in the south of France uh, yeah and, you know. and what a cast as well I mean, it's incredible. It's extraordinary, you know, the level of people that have, that have been on Riviera. I was browsing, yeah. you know, earlier on, I completely forgotten that Will Arnett had done it. And I was like, oh, well, yeah. of course, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Will, and God bless him, he came over, and um, I think it was probably a lot less money than he's used to, I don't know, uh, but I think the idea of a summer in the south of France, really, oh, yeah. he was too good to resist. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I met him the night that he arrived in town. We uh, all had dinner together, all bunch of us and he just got in and he'd had a hairy fight over it because somebody's ipad had caught fire and oh, no. turned back or something there air. but he got there and he was lovely and very funny and uh, very popular part of the show yeah have you got a favorite star you've worked with uh, 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 uh not really it, it, and i don't mean that in a bad way i i generally um and i don't also don't mean this the way it sounds, but I generally have as little to do with the actors as possible <laughs> uh, <laughs> un until kind of the rap, the rap party, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, mostly I don't have to anyway. On, on a show like Riviera, you will get notes from 
uh, Julia Stiles will come through to you. Um, and that's fine because Julia is a smart cook and, and knows the character and you know. So I'd, you, I would have that kind of interaction, but on the whole, um, and of course very often the show isn't even cast while I'm writing anyway. Yeah. Uh, so I know whatever. And uh, by the time they are shooting, by the time the actors are all involved, it's 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 what I was saying earlier about Deutschland. I'm three shows in three countries away, so um, apart from maybe going to a screening or a party, uh, I don't necessarily always really forge much of a relationship with the actors in, in the shows I've worked on, um, for better or for worse. So, but, yeah. yeah, but just looking forward. Um... And to round off with a, with a joyful question, two, a two-part question, what's next for you? And also, just to finish off, what has been your most happy memory as a screenwriter? Oh, uh, uh, well, the first one I can answer uh, relatively is that I'm working on a bunch of things, some of which I can't talk about as always, uh, some of which I can't. So I'm, next week, I am kicking off on, we're going to be doing a Zoom room, uh, a new show with Anna Finger, the... Um, creator of Deutschland and she has a, a show set up at Netflix which I have read about online so I assume I can mention it called Flight Portfolio uh, which is a true story about uh, a group uh, of Americans in Vichy France during the Second World War who uh, organized the escape of in the end it was supposed to be 200 in the end it was 1500 artists and intellectuals before the Gestapo could catch up with them Brilliant. so it's World War Two, it's spies, it's the south of France, it ticks a lot of my boxes. Oh, so Steve. We're uh, going to kick off on that. Um, I'm d uh, developing, I'm writing, literally in the middle of writing a pilot for a new show with uh, Jonathan Young again for HBO, which will be set in Romania, which is a revenge thriller slash heist movie slash western um, that I think we might have some fun with. Jorg Finger and I, the other, uh, Anna's husband, co-creator of Toys and Week, we're talking about something new at the moment as well. Um, and I'm working on a series which is set in the world of international sports in the 1960s, mm. uh, based on a true story. So, and then there's a couple of other things bubbling under. So those are all uh, kind of ticking away. And my happiest moment as a writer, um, I... Do you know what? I think probably I've had many happy moments as a writer. I, I, going to Berlin, you know what? Going to Berlin on Deutsche 86 and going there full time and giving myself over wholeheartedly to one show for a time, which is not something I often have the luxury of doing. Um, and from night one, just having a ball there and just kind of sitting there. On my own at night, sometimes I go to those great little restaurants around the corner, Pastor Nacht and Ashton, a beautiful part of town, and sitting writing and sitting there in the evenings thinking, you're doing all right, you know, life's good, you're doing all right, this is, this is a great way to make a living, and look at what's happening here. So that was one of many um, joyful moments and experiences for me. Steve, you paint a beautiful picture, and I yeah. think all of us listening would just like to be sitting next to you at the next table having a jar. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But, yeah. but you're, you're ordering the wine. We'll uh, you well done deal. Always. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thank you, mate.